Thirdly, what do we need? What does our team need? Well, we need a solid game plan. Any winning team needs a solid game plan. Winners pay attention to the fundamentals of the game. Yeah, they might do some around-the-back passes. They might do some fancy plays. But down, at their core, they have studied the fundamentals, and they know exactly, exactly what to do. And our team has a game plan, and hopefully it's sitting in your lap right now. It's called the Word of God. We have an inspired game plan. Psalm chapter 1. Blessed is the man who does not walk in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stand in the way of sinners, nor sit in the seat of the scornful. But his delight is in the law of the Lord. The fundamentals. This is his game plan. That's where he finds his delight. He'll be like a, a, a tree planted by still waters. Whatever he does will prosper. I can tell you, I want that for me. I want that for my family. I want that for my kids, and I want it for my church. Second Timothy says this, 3.16. God's word is inspired. It's, it's God-breathed, and it is profitable. So let it be known as a, as a statement of fact, not as a challenge or as a, I hope so one day. This is a fact. God's word is our game plan at Kingsland. That's a fact. God's word is our game plan. Not pop culture. Not the newest fad. Not the newest guru who has all the cool ideas on what to do next. Not the newest church growth book, and I guess conversely, not the traditions of the past. God's Word is our game plan. When we take the Word of God seriously as individuals and as a church, victory will be the result. And the application is very direct. We need to spend a whole lot more time in God's Word. We need to acquaint ourselves with the game plan and practice it and put it into effect. And someone's going to say, well, I don't understand it all. Well, and, and, and on one hand, it's so simple that a fourth grader can understand it. On the other hand, it is so complex that a Ph.D. could never completely understand it all. I like what Mark Twain said. It's not the parts of Scripture that I don't understand that I'm worried about. It's the parts that I do understand that trouble me. Isn't that true? I think it was David Jeremiah or maybe Adrian Rogers who said, don't expect for God to help, help you understand more until you've obeyed what you already do understand. Act on what you know to be true before you start seeking for deep revelation down the road. We need to embrace God's game plan. Number four, what does a great team need? It needs strong leadership. I'm talking about from within the team. Any great team has leaders, athletes, individuals who are um, strong leaders. A successful church team needs men and women, young and not so young, who will step out and stand up and lead by listening to the coach, by putting the game plan into action and living a disciplined life. Go over to 1 Timothy chapter 4, because we see something kind of neat over here. If you go to 1 Timothy 4, you can see to, to, to the young. The Timothys, 1 Timothy 4.12, let no one despise your youth. Don't let anybody look down on you because you're young, but be an example to the believers in word and conduct and love and spirit and faith and purity. Be an example. If you're a young leader, be a holy, chaste, pure young leader. You're never too young to lead. How about our older leaders? Well, just look a few verses down to chapter 5. Do not rebuke an older man, but exhort him as a father, younger men as brothers, older women as mothers, younger women as sisters, with all purity. Leadership. How, look, keep going. What about pastors? Verse 17 of chapter 5. Let the elders who rule well be counted worthy of double honor especially those who labor in the word and doctrine. So back to Kingsland. We have a, a pastor. We have a pastoral staff. You need strong leadership. A church like ours needs strong leadership. And I bet 99% of the people would go, amen, until that leadership disagrees with something you want. Then you'll see your real attitude about strong leadership about the deacons, committee leaders, team members, teachers, strong leaders, ministry leaders of every kind. Every job, every leader is important, and we need more. We need leaders of all ages and all levels of leadership to step up and mentor and lead the team. And I thank God for our veteran, godly, faithful leaders who have stood the test of time into their 60s, into their 70s, and beyond. 
I thank God for you. They keep moving forward. Sometimes they're moving a little slower than they used to, but they're still moving forward. And I thank God for you. I love you. And for our new, younger, fresh leadership who are stepping up to the plate, we need strong leadership within the team. Number five, what does a great team need? An enormous amount of practice. My wife loves to correct me when I say practice makes perfect. She says, no, no, perfect practice makes perfect. A great team spends an enormous amount of time in practice, preparation, lots and lots and lots of hard work. Look over to Philippians chapter 3, verse 12. Philippians chapter 3, verse 12. You know, God grabbed a hold of your life for a reason. And it's because he wants you to grab a hold of the mission that he has for your life. And Paul here says he's not yet attained, and neither have we, but we need to press on. Are you there in Philippians chapter 3, verse 12? Not that I've already attained or am already perfected, but I press on, that I may hold, may lay hold of that for which Christ Jesus has hold, laid hold of me. Brethren, I do not count myself to have apprehended, but one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forward to those things which are ahead, I press toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. So God grabbed a hold of you, and he did that for a reason. He wants you to grab a hold of his mission for your life, of his purpose for your existence. Press on. Press on. We cannot live our lives fixated on the rearview mirror. If you do that, you're going to run right into the guy in front of you, and it's embarrassing. God's not done with you. He's just getting started. You believe that? He's not done with you. We cannot be um, stuck thinking about all the mistakes of the past or all the successes of the past. For better or worse, we can't change the past, but we can refocus our attention on the goal, on the prize ahead. And yes, practice is hard work. If you love what you're doing, practice is fun. But even if you love what you're doing, no matter, what you, no matter how much you love it, it gets old sometimes. It's hard work. But it prepares you for the competition. Victory is never, ever a gift. We know that, don't we? It's never a gift. It's always hard-earned. But because it is so difficult to come by, it is equally rewarding. I want to experience that reward. I want for Kingsland to experience that reward. My favorite coach, Coach Gibbs, Joe Gibbs, said this. A winning effort begins with preparation. A winning effort begins with preparation. So here's the application. Please don't zone out. Hear this. Success with our team here at Kingsland is determined by the amount of time, energy, effort, passion, and concentration, and resources that you are willing to devote to attain that victory. Our co coach wants us to experience that victory, but he's not the one playing the game. We are. You are. And, and if every team, somebody else thinks the other guy's going to take the, the important shot, or someone else is going to play defense, or someone else is going to put in the hard work, you're going to have a losing team. Our success at Kingsland is determined by the amount of time and energy and passion and resources, putting your money where your mouth is, that you're willing to devote to attain that victory. So what does a winning team need? A good coach. Disciplined team members. A solid game plan. And we have that. Strong leadership, an enormous amount of practice. Number six, excellent communication. You can't win if you don't know how to communicate. You got to talk to your teammates. You got to trust your teammates. Excellent communication. Communication, first of all, with the coach. We call that prayer. And unity and harmony and open lines of communication between the, 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 the athletes, the players themselves. You got to communicate with our coach we got to communicate with each other. How are we doing there? Well, probably have some room for improvement, don't we? In Philippians chapter 4, verse 6, we're told don't be anxious, don't be stressed out, don't be, don't be worried all the time, but pray. Pray. Pray without ceasing. We should be in constant communication with our coach. It's absolutely vital for victory. And we can take our concerns to our head coach, knowing that he cares about us, and he'll take care of things for us. He'll take care of it. He's on your side. He loves you. He wants to help you. He'll give you victory. Communication with each other. Turn over to Hebrews chapter 10. 
Hebrews chapter 10. I want you to see this for yourself. It's very important. Any successful team spends a lot of time together, a whole lot of time together, communicating. Hebrews chapter 10, look at verse 23. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. Don't waver, don't quit, don't throw in the towel. Our coach is faithful. He's not going to let you down. Don't let him down. Verse 24, and let us consider one another in order to stir up love and good works. Now, that's what we should be doing. When we get together, whether it's at home, in our homes tonight, or hanging out on Friday night, or going out to lunch after church, or whatever, encourage one another. Stir each other up to good works. Confront when necessary, lovingly. Do that. Stir each other up for good works. Verse 25, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together, as the manner of some is. But exhorting one another, and so much more the more as you see the day approaching. What day? The day of Christ's return. He said, I will come again and receive you unto myself. And when you pick up the newspaper or you look at CNN or Fox News or whatever, and you see how this world is absolutely going berserk, don't let it get you on your heels and go, oh, no, what am I going to do? Hey, look, I'm scared, so to speak. I mean, imagine being in the way of that tsunami and all the destruction it wreaked in those folks' lives. Listen, pray for them. Nobody enjoys that kind of horrendous things happening but understand that we're just one day closer than we were yesterday to the return of Christ therefore do not forsake the assembling of yourselves together encourage one another get together be together communicate any successful team spends a whole lot of time talking and communicating that's why we had Bible study this morning because this is too big of a group to communicate that way we have little groups where discussion goes back and forth and Bible teaching and communication happens don't forsake that. We have Bible study tonight, Bible study Wednesday night. We have multiple opportunities. The ladies' new Bible study is starting Wednesday night. Get plugged in. Take advantage of it. It'll help you. Lastly, finally, number seven, and really the whole point of today. Number seven, what does a great team need? It needs a winning strategy. We need a winning strategy. Turn over to 2 Corinthians chapter 5, and this will be the last text we look at today. 2 Corinthians chapter 5 tells us that the love of God compels us. Just like when that tsunami, when that earthquake hit, and the tsunami, I guess at almost mock speed, began, began to, to, to head toward the shore, sirens went off, and, pe and all the way across the ocean towards Honolulu, and, and all the way even to the west coast, people were shooting out warnings, a tsunami's coming, and it did hit Hawaii. There were building, uh, businesses and stuff that were flooded there. And either a tsunami um, warning went off, I know it did in Japan, or somebody on the news, or even, if, it went, even if, if necessary, they would go door to door to door saying, destruction is coming. Because they were concerned about the people that lived there. They were concerned about their lives. 1 Corinthians 5, 14 tells us it's the love of Christ that compels us. It's God's love that motivates us to be like a human styrene. If necessary, to go door to door. Or if necessary, to go over to the flea market. Or, or go wherever we can go and, and engage in people's lives to tell them, destruction really is coming. Now, someone's going to say, that doesn't sound like good news. Well, the good news is the gospel. Jesus Christ loves you. He died on a cross for you. He was buried and he rose from the grave. He'll save your soul if you just ask for it. Look at, look at this text. For the love of Christ compels us because we judge thus. If one died for all, then all died. And if he died for all, that those who live should live no longer to themselves, but live for him who died for them and rose again. In other words, you were dead until Jesus Christ came into your life and he gave you life. But that life that he gave you, really what he wants you to do is just lay it down again. To die for him, just like he died for us. To die to our needs, our wants, our wishes our preferences, our having everything the way we want it, to inconvenience ourselves for those that are lost and that are dying and need spiritual life. Look down at verse 18. Now all, the, all these things, all things are of God, who has reconciled us to himself through Jesus Christ and has given us the ministry of reconciliation. You have been put on God's great big team and you've been given the job, the ministry that's our job description, the ministry of reconciliation. That is, that God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, not imputing their trespasses to them, and has committed to us the word of reconciliation. 
Now we are ambassadors for Christ.